Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and a very warm welcome to Lancaster Priory this evening. My name is Chris Newlands and I'm privileged to be the vicar here in this wonderful church. This church has been here for well over a thousand years and within that period there has been a great deal of tragedy, death and we hope at least a little of the sacred. So it's a huge pleasure to be able to welcome Professor Terry Eagleton to do this lecture this evening. But I do know my place because a prior in ecclesiastical terms is always subject to the dean. And so I hand over to the dean, um, Professor Simon, uh, to, to, to come and introduce the, uh, the lecture tonight. Thank you very much, Chris. Let me echo Chris's warm welcome uh, and good evening uh, to you all. As Chris says, my name is Simon Bainbridge and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Lancaster University. I'm also a member of the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing, so it's a particular pleasure for me to introduce my colleague, Terry Eagleton, who's Distinguished Professor of Literature here at Lancaster University. Formerly the Wharton Professor of English Literature at the University of Oxford and John Edward Taylor Professor of Cultural Theory at the University of Manchester, Professor Eagleton has held visiting appointments at universities around the world, including Cornell, Duke, Iowa, Melbourne, Trinity College in Dublin and Yale. He's the author of over 50 books, including the very well-known and pioneering Literary Theory and Introduction, and much of his recent work has focused on literature and religion, an area of research strength in our own department. For example, he's the author of Reason, Faith and Revolution, Reflection on the God Debate, and he gave the Richard Price Memorial Lecture on the subject of the new athe atheism and the war on terror. Terry was appointed here at Lancaster in 2008, and he makes three visits every year to the department. Uh, when he's with us, he gives a mix of undergraduate lectures, one-to-one -one postgraduate tutorials, open research seminars and public lectures and obviously we're delighted to have him as a colleague in the department. His most recent public lecture was at the Story Institute in October of last year, which was a lecture on both Luther and Lenin to mark the 100th anniversary of Luther's, Luther's 95 Theses and the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. He's currently in the first year of a three-year series of six open research seminars entitled From Beginning to End, in which, each time alongside uh, a different departmental colleague, he explores a major theological or biblical theme via engagement with literature. The series runs from creation through the fall onto, next academic year, death, hell and crucifixion, before in 2019 to 20, will conclude with seminars on redemption and apocalypse. And so details of that series, which I'm sure will be of interest to you all, will be on the department website and on social media. They're free and open to the public. Terry's most recent publication is Radical Sacrifice, published by Yale University Press in March this year, a work described by John Milbank as, I quote, a magisterial treatment which manages to be both balanced and un uncompromising. So we recently discussed the key ideas of the book on Radio 4's Thinking Aloud programme, still available on iPlayer if you haven't heard it. And today he's going to talk to us on the related subject of death, tragedy and the sacred. So just to let you know that the format will be Terry will lecture, we'll then take informal questions after the lecture as part of the, the drinks reception and Terry's also kindly agreed to do a book signing too. So please join me in welcoming Professor Terry Eagleton. Well, I'm sorry to have to interrupt the music. I always seem to be spoiling the fun. You know, you have to stop enjoying yourself now and listen to a lecture. Um, the word sacred, can you hear all that at the back? Is that okay? No, you can't. Ah, how about that? Is that better? Can you hear that? Yes? yes? All right? Good. As I was put my water. Oh, yeah. um, 
The word sacred is more ambiguous than we normally think. Um, if Jesus was sacred, it's not only because he was said to be the son of God, but because he was crucified. And uh, the Jews of his time regarded crucifixion as a mark of being cursed. The word sacred in Latin, as you may know, means both blessed and cursed together. Crosses and curses were closely allied at the time. Um, in fact, Jesus never, I think, unequivocally claims the title of Son of God, and he certainly doesn't claim to be the Messiah. He couldn't have been the Messiah because the, Mes the Jews thought of the Messiah as a secular military figure, not as a holy man, as Jesus was. And anyway, the title Son of God, theologically speaking, could mean more or less what you like. It doesn't mean anything very specific. All Jews were sons or daughters of God. It was no big deal to call yourself Son of God, if he did, which he doesn't seem to have done in the Gospel. And in any case, um, it wouldn't be a crucifying matter if you did, yes? It'd be strange if you're using the phrase in some special way to indicate a special kind of intimacy with Yahweh, but the phrase Son of God couldn't have got him executed. In fact, we don't really know why he was executed, and maybe the Gospel writers don't know either. Um, there are some certain confusions in the text, and of course they weren't eyewitnesses, they were writing quite a bit afterwards, so maybe they were ignorant too. Um, it wouldn't, to call yourself Son of God, or the even more puzzling Son of Man, whatever that means, uh, it wouldn't have been a crucifying matter, not even for the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate, um, a figure who is shamelessly whitewashed by the Gospels, you know, turned into some kind of inquiring, metaphysically minded, vacillating, guardian reading liberal, you know, but who we know is a total bastard. We, we, we know quite a bit about Pilate in real Pilate, and, and the real Pilate would have crucified at the drop of a hat. He would have crucified his own grandmother and thought nothing about it. Um, in fact, he was finally dishonorably dismissed from the Roman service, and you had to be pretty dishonorable to be dismissed by the Romans. Um, uh, in any case, the occupying power, the Romans wouldn't have been in the least bothered about the theological squabbles of their colonial underlings, so they wouldn't have cared much if Jesus had called whatever he called himself, unless there were politically seditious connotations to what he said, in which case the Romans would have been very interested indeed. Um, but the Son of God doesn't sound as though it's got those uh, treasonable connotations, unless uh, Jesus really was seditious and the Gospel writers are editing that out uh, as a part of a way of cozying up to the imperial powers, which they seem to do, That's, for example, in their treatment, uh, their grotesquely distorted treatment of Pontius Pilate. Um, so why Jesus was executed is not clear, um, uh, except, of course, that we know that the Romans reserved crucifixion for political rebels almost exclusively. The idea was not just that it was excruciatingly painful, um, but that you were pinned up on the edge of the city as a warning to others, as a kind of advertisement. You try fighting the mightiest power in the world, and this is what will happen to you. It's a kind of warning. Um, so Jesus died the death, we know that, of a political rebel, which doesn't, of course, necessarily mean that he was one. We don't know. Um, or at least one who was thought to be a rebel, um, or maybe it was convenient for somebody to pretend that he was. Perhaps it was convenient for the ruling caste of the Jews, the Sanhedrin, to persuade 
the Romans that he was a rebel. And of course, the Jews at Passover occupied by the Romans, the whole atmosphere would have been, I mean, easily ignited at any moment. And it may well be that the Sanhedrin feared that this enormously popular character, though there's some evidence that John the Baptist was more popular than Jesus, this very popular character might cause a conflagration which would bring the whole brutal force of Roman imperial power down on the heads of their hapless people and that therefore they shocked Jesus to the Romans under some pretense, perhaps, that he was a rebel, while maybe knowing that he wasn't. The sign that the Romans uh, put up above his, uh, his cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, is, I think, a kind of sick joke. I mean, Nazareth was a sort of bumpkin-like place, you know, a kind of rural backwater, provincial. Jesus was probably the son, not of a carpenter, but of a stonemason. There's some evidence for that, but certainly for a very provincial one. And to call, to say, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, will be a bit like saying, you know, Fred Smith of Barnsley, President of the Universe. You know, a satirical jibe at this blowing from far-flung, redneck, parochial Galilee. Um, if, by the way, he really did only um, spend six hours on the cross, as the New Testament tells us, then he got away remarkably lightly. I once made the dreadful mistake of saying that on BBC Radio, and was plagued for months later by shed loads of letters from outraged evangelicals who promised to pray for my soul while deeply doubting that I had one. But he did, he did. A lot of crucified people thrashed around for days. You know? um, what may have helped there is the scourging that he supposedly underwent, we're told he underwent uh, beforehand. If you lose a lot of blood before you're crucified, then you would die much more quickly, so maybe he was scourged. Anyway, uh, the crucifixion, of course, conveys the central message of Christianity, that message of great cheer and consolation and pie in the sky, namely, if you don't love, you're dead, and if you do, they'll kill you. There's your consolation for you. How can things be sacred in the sense of both blessed and cursed together? St. Paul says of Jesus that though he wasn't sinful in himself, he was made sin for our sake. Um, and what he probably has in mind here is the ancient practice of scapegoating. The scapegoat is innocent in itself, but is loaded with the crimes of the community and thrust out into the wilderness in a kind of collective self-purging, or if you like, in Freudian terms, a collective self-disavowal of one's crimes, a heaping, a projection of them upon somebody else. Um, the scapegoat is what has been described as a guilty innocent. Um, indeed, paradoxically, one who becomes more innocent, more virtuous, the more selflessly it takes on the transgressions of others and so becomes more polluted. The more the scapegoat is besmirched and polluted by taking on the sins of the polis, of the city-state, the more blessed and spotless, ironically, it is. So that to say that the scapegoat is sacred is paradoxically to say that it's pure and blameless, but also monstrous, cursed and deformed, like the crucified as a bearer of the sins of others. And that's really what I think St. Paul is getting at. Um, this is the condition of Jesus on the cross, to be blessed and cursed at the same time. Things which are sacred are awesome in the sense of being holy and transcendent and radiant, but also in the sense of being terrifying, terrible to look upon, like the Medusa's head, or that tortured, reviled, abandoned figure on Calvary. If you want to know the truth about humanity, the idea is take a look at this. Take a look at this body, uh, if you can bear to, if you can bear the real. Incidentally, another reason why Jesus probably wasn't a rebel is that 
the, the Romans didn't move in to arrest his comrades when he died, as they almost certainly would have done uh, if, um, if he was. What's most terrible and terrifying for Christianity is God himself. Some Protestant theology sees God really as having two sides to him, one loving and one wrathful. Um, it's as though he swings from one mood to the other as the fancy takes him, like some petulant prima donna or pampered rock star. Uh, on this theory, God, like some celestial Tom Cruise, is of uncertain temperament and needs to be constantly humoured and cajoled, provided with an endless supply of uh, slain rams and roasted oxen and so on. And not that Tom Cruise is provided with those things as far as I know, but you can see the analogy. Um, this misses the point, however, that the love and terror of God are, of course, the same thing. What's most fearful about Yahweh is his ruthless, uncompromising, unconditional love, which is very strange, which we can't really understand because our love is always in some way conditional, which will burn you up if you don't look sharp. The fire of hell is, of course, God himself, who is portrayed by the Hebrew scriptures as a raging fire, which is terrible to look upon. Incidentally, the good news about hell you'll be delighted to hear is you don't actually burn forever and ever and ever. You're just annihilated, yes. There can be no life outside God, of course. It's not a place. Um, and the fire of Hell is, as I say, the fire of God's love, as the way it's presented in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's this that we can't take, uh, which we need to tame and avert and domesticate, uh, not least by those ritual practices known as religion, which converts the business of transforming the face of the earth into being very nice to each other. So Yahweh is sacred because he's two-faced, because his love both destroys and renews, destroys in order to renew. It's a question of radical transformation, not of piecemeal reform. And this is to say that the sacred is to be distinct, distinguished from our common or garden existence, not because of its piety and high-mindedness, uh, but not because it's redolent of incense or uh, calls for a reverent silence, but because it's dangerous. The sacred is what is dangerous. It's a power more radical, more revolutionary than our everyday lives, which is why it has to be handled with extreme care. Uh, it's a kind of divine violence, really. We're always liable to get burnt if we don't watch it in the presence of the sacred. Tribal societies, pre-modern societies, tend to understand this in their own way, not least when somebody ventures out onto the edges of everyday existence and crosses some perilous border into a deeper dimension. Such liminal or transitional places uh, are hedged around with special ceremonies and rites of passage because at these fragile points you're confronting powers that can make or break you. Uh, that can bring you new life, to be sure, but only by forcing you, like Jesus on the cross, into a creative confrontation with death. Only by being taken apart can you be put together again, or as Yeats writes, uh, nothing can be sold or whole that has not been rent. The sacred people uh, are those who are marked out for death, Indeed, Jesus speaks of his own death as his consecration. Martyrs are those rare creatures, like the great protagonists of tragedy, from Sophocles' Oedipus to Eliot's Thomas Beckett in Murder in the Cathedral, who are able to make something rich and strange out of their deaths, capable of living their death to the very end, um, and making a gift of their death to others. And this involves not grabbing prematurely at the possibility of new life emerging from this process, not being cocksure about it, not having it as a sort of trump card up your sleeve. 
To live your death to the full means not to treat it simply as an entry ticket to paradise. Uh, if Jesus had said to himself on the cross, well, only six hours strung up here, and then three days in the tomb, and then off to heaven for all eternity, well, it's not a bad deal, you know, I'm up for that. He would, of course, never have been raised from the dead. You really do have to see death as a dead end if it's to turn out to be a horizon. And the fact that there are never any guarantees is known as faith. In the um, Jewish and Christian scriptures, those who are especially sacred are the poor and dispossessed, the so-called anoim. Um, as St. Luke writes, you shall know, paraphrasing him, you shall know Yahweh for whom he is, for whom he is, when you see the poor being filled with good things and the rich sent empty away. And he's drawing there on a long tradition of the anoim, uh, the the filth of the earth, as St. Paul calls them, uh, the destitute and self-dispossessed as being the most obvious agents of God's power. Um, and that in, that in many different senses. I mean, the poor are sacred in the sense of being, um, in the negative sense of sacred, of being cursed, destitute, crippled, deficient, in their full humanity, but this destitution, ironically, paradoxically, is also a kind of blessing or strength for one reason, because those who are dispossessed have nothing to lose, which is why they have the perilousness of all sacred powers. They have less investment in the status quo and are therefore more in principle, more open to the promise of that transformed future which the gospel calls the kingdom of God. People who are oppressed um, are very likely to stay that way as long as there's something, however meagre and paltry, in it for them. There has to be something in it, however trifling, for the oppressed, because, um, for one thing, the perils of an unknown alternative are too great as long as the system can still supply you, buy you off, as it were, with some kind of satisfaction. Um, and that's one reason, of course, why revolutions are pretty rare, and that's quite rational. Why venture out into some fearful unknown when you're, you know, not happy at least reaping something or other from what you have? If, however, there's hardly anything in it for people at all, as, say, for the men and women of apartheid-era South Africa or of the neo-Stalinist regimes of Eastern Europe, um, or if any alternative seems just about uh, an improvement on what you have, then men and women will revolt as surely as night follows day. That's rational as well. Uh, what, what, after all, have they got to lose? So the powers of this world, as St. John darkly calls them, must therefore be very careful not to give their underlings the impression that they have nothing to lose. That's a political mistake. Um, you can't hold them down simply by coercion. You can coerce some of the people some of the time, but not all of the people all of the time. You have to be thrown the odd bag of goodies from time to time. And if the powers of the world are themselves to survive, uh, if they are to survive, that has to happen. But we know, of course, we know, of course, from the gospel that they won't survive for long. St. John sees the cross and resurrection as tolling the death knell of what he calls the powers of this world, you know, crooked bankers, corrupt presidents, paedophile bishops and the rest, which are even now, in his eyes, washed up, dépassé, finished, uh, on their last legs, dead on their feet, any other metaphor you care to think of, which is synonymous, in the face of a radically new and startlingly avant-garde regime, which, had we but eyes to see it, is even now breaking violently into the bankrupt, outdated world that we have. And this, one might venture, is also part of the central message, the kerygma, the impossible news of the Christian gospel. 
The poor are also sacred, the Anuim, um, because by bearing witnesses, witness to the injustices of the present, not necessarily by what they say or do, but simply by virtue of what they are, as a sign, as a signifier, they are negative signs of a transformed future. They indicate, they mark what remains to be done, the unfinished business of history, the fatal flaw at the heart of a self-satisfied present. The only true image of the future, then, is the failure of the present, not some beautiful blueprint of utopia, but the failure of the present. And it's thus that the weakness of the Anoim is also a kind of strength, which is part of the paradox of all sacred things. Those who can't fall any further um, are gifted with a strange kind of invulnerability. As Edgar remarks in King Lear, things the worst must cease or else climb up to what they were before. Or to put it rather differently, um, only those who lose their lives can save them, which is why the first thing uh, the church does to a human being is drown it. Well, symbolically speaking, you know, we don't go the whole hog. You know. Baptism, of course, is not, not, not about washing, it's about drowning. And poverty is a kind of anticipation of one's death. Um, in other words, you can turn your impoverished condition into a sort of virtue, as, for example, monastic people do, non monks or nuns. It's a kind of anticipation of one's death when one will be stripped not only of one's goods, but of one's very selfhood. And those who can somehow rehearse that final self-dispossession in their actual lives, who can prefigure the future in that way, um, and who do so by that other kind of self-dispossession, which is love, those are, I suppose, the ones with the best chance of coming through in one piece. In this respect, the Anawim have a distinct advantage over Donald Trump. Because they have no power of their own, they're the best possible witnesses to the fact that what power they have comes from God and is thus the most enduring form of strength. The only authentic power is one that springs from a compact with failure, as Sam Beckett didn't need telling. Those like Trump or Rupert Murdoch who don't understand this will find it almost impossible to die. Um, not to have rehearsed your death in self-dispossession means that you find it very hard to die, and if you find it absolutely impossible to give yourself away, then that's known as hell. Um, or at least as purgatory. I used to make the terrible mistake um, that um, William Golding's great novel, Pincher Martin, and I won't give away the end, uh, it's a novel about hell, but it's not actually. It's a novel about purgatory, because we don't actually see whether the ruthless black lightning of God's love does manage to break Martin's defences down and dissolve him to nothing and therefore redeem him, or whether, you know, it will just abolish him, just annihilate him. Tragic drama, from Sophocles to the present, um, is much preoccupied with that transfigurative moment in which, at which the acknowledgement of one's weakness, or might call it in Christian terms repentance or confession, or use the biblical term metanoia, the Greek term, becomes a curious kind of strength as the, for example, the broken, blind, polluted, incestuous Oedipus, himself just a walking bunch of riddles and contradictions, an undecipherable enigma, is in Oedipus at Colonus, received back into the city in a very, very risky act of faith by the city's ruler, uh, from which a great transformative power for good will follow as Oedipus moves from beggar to king. And of course, the connection between beggars and kings is a very close one in tragedy and literature in general. What Lear calls the poor forked creature, the houseless, naked, unadorned, unaccommodated human being, beyond any particular language or culture or kinship, 
is sacred because it reminds us of the sheer bedrock of our shared humanity uh, upon which any enduring social order has to be built. And there's something very anonymous and impersonal about that shared humanity. It's nothing personal. It's just the fact of belonging to a species of being flesh and blood. Um, in our own era, um, this, this dreadful image which we must seek to look upon without illusion or sentimentalism or bogus hope is the concentration camp victim, which one modern philosopher has called Homo Sacer, sacred man, but also cursed in his monstrous inhumanity, but holy in the sense that only by seeing in him a reflection of our own monstrous humanity, that's to say those powers which have done this to him, can there be the slightest hope of redemption. Homo Sacer is a curiously paradoxical creature like the scapegoat, because in one sense, He's inhuman because culture, language, kinship, and so on is what constitutes us as human beings. Uh, at the same time, he's stripped of all that uh, to be just nakedly and sheerly, um, houselessly and culturelessly hot human. Yes, and there's something deeply anonymous about that, um, which is also rather like the um, anonymous power of love, uh, uh, what distinguishes of course, the Christian idea of love, among other things, from um, the kind of rather boring, sort of romantic, erotic, sentimental traditions of love that the West is so hung up upon, is that love for the New Testament is absolutely nothing personal. Absolutely nothing personal. It doesn't matter whether you know the person whose place you take in the queue for the concentration camp. It doesn't matter what you're feeling as this whole phony, romantic, and erotic, and sentimental tradition would have us believe when you give somebody a cup of water, uh, what matters is that you do it. Love for the New Testament is a social practice, nothing to do with feeling. It doesn't matter how you're feeling. Um, right. Uh, so that our, it's as though our sickness runs so deep that only by building on this anonymous foundation of flesh and blood, what we ultimately share, regardless of culture, uh, terrible though it is to look upon this dehumanized figure, um, only through that can our achievements have any hope of redemption, of standing firm, so that in a kind of homeopathic movement, the disease must somehow become part of the cure, which is a traditional motif of tragedy. And this duality or ambivalence is also part of what we mean by the sacred. Let me take a, a practical modern example of this process whereby, as with the ancient city of Athens, confronted by the dreadful sight of, uh, of Oedipus, the polluted Oedipus, uh, we're invited to identify ourselves with the monstrous, the outcast, and inhuman as the indispensable condition of our own redemption. Take the so-called war on terror, in which, as, with, as in so much tragedy, uh, we confront a raging fury on our very doorstep, a liminal threshold type of fury. If tragic figures, incidentally, like Oedipus or Leo or Jesus, the crucifixion is of course paradigmatically tragic, even though it results in the resurrection because tragedy isn't a matter of things necessarily ending badly. Not all tragedies end badly. One of the greatest first tragedies we have, um, um, the Aristia, it doesn't end badly. Tragedy isn't necessarily about play, things ending badly, it's about the fact that you have to be hauled through hell if you're going to have the slightest chance of things you know, ending well. And tragic figures are always, or almost always, figures of the threshold, liminal creatures on the edge of the city inhabiting some twilight zone between life and death. But where did this monster of terrorism spring from? Well, all kinds of uh, dubious places, to be sure. But one answer, surely, is from the foreign policy of the West, 
in the middle decades of the last century. What happened then was that for its own political and economic purposes, the West rode roughshod over variously reasonably enlightened forces in the Arab world, secularism, socialism, revolutionary nationalism, and so on. It rolled back Nasserism, it armed the radical Islamists in Afghanistan, it supported odiously autocratic governments in Iran, Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere. It was complicit in the slaughter of some half million communists in Indonesia, and so on. And in driving back these forces, it created a political vacuum into which, some decades later, a peculiarly ugly form of Islamic fundamentalism was able to move. I don't mean to suggest by this that radical Islamists aren't responsible for the atrocities they commit, but the West certainly played a major part in fostering the conditions which have given birth to them. So that like Prospero with Caliban, we can turn to Islamic State and say, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine, or at least in part. Uh, but of course we don't. For the conservative, monsters are other people. For the liberal, there are no monsters, just people inadequately potty trained. For the radical, the true monsters are ourselves. Um, so the answer to terrorism is not, of course, more terror, but justice. Justice is the only answer to terrorism. But um, the darker side of the tale is it may well be too late for that. Terror has a kind of momentum of its own, which keeps breeding itself. Let me just say a word, finally, about what some people call sacred texts, like this extraordinary Bible with a crown above my head, you know, symbol of everything I'm talking about. Um, uh, there are sacred texts, but in the sense of sacred I'm meaning, that's to say in the sense of dangerous texts, pieces of writing which are at once destructive and transformative, and so have to be handled with care. The most influential text by far of 19th century Europe was not on the origin of species, but was the Communist Manifesto, which falls squarely into this category. Um, but there is a sense, nevertheless, I suppose, in which all writing is profane. The word text is related, of course, to the word textile, meaning something spun out of many different threads, intricately woven together. And if this is how shirts and handkerchiefs come into being, it's also how poems and novels do. A good poem or a great drama is woven out of so many diverse threads of meaning, each one with so many multiple resonances that you could explore it almost indefinitely. Um, in fact, this is also true uh, of some of our most commonplace declarations, which are always traced through with the multiple uses of others. For, it, for us, it's not true that there is a, a beginning word, as it is for St. John when he says in the beginning was the word. But for there to be a word, there must always already have been another one. Um, there's a sense, for example, as some literary critics have pointed out, in which the words, I love you, are always a quotation. You may not mean it as a quotation, you may be burningly sincere, but it is a quotation anyway. Um, words come to us tarnished and shop-soiled, or if you prefer, burnished and enriched, used already by billions of anonymous speakers, and freighted with all kinds of different meanings, which isn't to suggest that you can't use them sincerely, just that we can never use language originally, not even in poetry, which I suppose comes closest to it. Um, so that all writing is radically promiscuous. When Jacques Derrida famously says there's nothing outside the text, he doesn't, he doesn't mean you know, that the world is furnished only with books. He means there's nothing which isn't textual, which isn't woven out of a whole set of different threads, not just literary text, but anything. Um, sometimes texts drop out of sight for decades or even centuries and then, so to speak, and become, so to speak, unreadable. 
simply not engaging our interests at all, and then suddenly some historical event or some new occurrence may galvanise them into life once more, and they become newly readable. Once again, we are able to read them. Um, the 19th century, for example, found it quite impossible to enjoy or even read one of the greatest of all English novels, Samuel Richardson's 18th century portrait of an abused and violated woman, Clarissa. The fact that it's also by far the longest English novel may have something to do with, uh, with this reluctance to read it. Uh, then, in the late 20th century, along came the women's movement and Clarissa became newly readable. I even wrote a remarkably cheap and extraordinarily perceptive book about it myself. Um, we don't know what Oedipus the King meant to its original Athenian audience, but we can be pretty sure it didn't mean exactly what it means to us. Meaning, in other words, is historical and contextual, which is why all writing is profane and impure, shot through with the traces of others' uses and readings, a palimpsest rather than a virginal sheet. Whenever you have meaning, and what distinguishes humans from other animals is that they, were, they move in a world of peculiarly well-developed meaning. Wherever you have meaning, you can always be sure that there's more meaning where that came from. There could never just be one meaning any more than there could be just one person, or one letter, or one number. Meaning is in that sense or concept, it's a differential idea. So uh, in this sense at least, the phrase sacred literature um, is an oxymoron or self-contradictory phrase like military intelligence um, or my own preference, um, business ethics. This is also why there's something incoherent, I think, about biblical fundamentalism because such fundamentalism is really a mistake about writing. It's really a mistake about the nature of language. It assumes that meaning can be fixed and arrested for all time, particularly scriptural meaning. But language only works because, as the later Wittgenstein teaches us, because it's fluid and diverse and fuzzy and rough at the edges. It wouldn't work uh, if it wasn't. As Wittgenstein famously says, you know, the ice is beautiful but we can't walk there, back to the rough ground, the rough ground of everyday meaning. The fact that language is rough and ready isn't a flaw any more than the handle of a cup is a defect in the pottery. A scientifically exact speech would be useless for everyday life, and in this and in other ways, fundamentalism is really a form of pathological anxiety. It's interesting, and I think in a, in a vague sense rather hopeful, that um, uh, hate uh, springs largely from fear, rather from anxiety, you know, the hatred of fundamentalism. Whether we're talking about Texans or Talibans, doesn't really matter, you know, springs from a sense of being uh, crushed and overlooked and uprooted and left behind, and the dread, dreadful, murderous fury that one imagine an infant must feel when it's neglected and overlooked. Um, such fundamentalism fears that unless you can nail meaning down once and for all, then all it will start to float free. This is simply to be prisoner of a certain metaphor. Meanings are neither nailed down nor floating free. We can't really use spatial metaphors about them. It's, uh, if you don't nail meaning down once and for all, for fundamentalism, then all you will ever have is chaos and ambiguity. It's a version of what one might call the argument from the floodgates, of which one should always be wary. You know, once allow one football player to pass back to the goalkeeper, and key phrase, before you know where you are, every player will be passing back to the goalkeeper all the time, and the game will never get started. It's a pathological anxiety. Um, if a word doesn't mean only one thing inflexibly and immutably, then for this particular um, theory, it can mean absolutely everything. If you accept that the phrase 
Sophia is hotter than Carolina can have more than a geographical meaning. Uh, then, before you know where you are, key phrase, it might mean never turn your back on a psychopathic dormouse. Yes. The authoritarian is linked to the anarchist as, as it were, an inverted mirror image of the anarchist. The anarchist is the prodigal son of the patriarchal father, and they are linked Oedipally in that way. Um, those in love with a vision of absolute order and purity uh, are those most fearful of their own anarchic impulses. Take Nazism, which on the one hand is devoted to utter order, utter precision, utter military-style regularity, and at the very same time revels in meaninglessness, revels in that kind of, in the demonic. And the demonic is not simply the evil, the demonic is that kind of cackle of incredulous laughter of those who think that the idea that anything human could be meaningful or valuable is just so much rubbish. Yes, Iago comes quite close to that in Othello. Um, the demonic is a kind of meaninglessness, not just that, but a reveling in absurdity. And one form of demonic meaninglessness is severe pain, is being in, say, chronic, uh, incurable pain. So we should be alarmed by the idea of purity. It's too close to fascism for comfort. And there's nothing pure about the crucifixion or indeed about Jesus' rather cavalier ways with the purity laws. Um, for him to say, let the dead bury their dead, when the young man who is going to follow him says, you know, hang on for a minute while I go and bury my relative, would be an unspeakable moral obscenity for a Jew a Jew of those days, uh, to bury the dead would be an absolutely sacred duty. And for Jesus to take such a cavalier view of it, you know, it's the living who matter, not the dead, um, is, is, is very transgressive, I think. So, are there any sacred texts? Well, my answer is a firm and unequivocal yes and no. Um, yes, if you mean pieces of writing which have perilous powers, and are to be handled with care. No, if you mean pieces of writing which are not caught up with other pieces of writing and are, as it were, either contaminated or newly or renewed by them. So, on the one hand and on the other hand, what more appropriate gesture to make in an Anglican church?